During 1988, I was on the Raphael team for creating the partnership between Martin Marietta and, and Raphael. It was not only a business partnership, but it was a partnership between people and the top companies. It was due to the leadership of you, Norman, and the leadership of uh, late Musa Peler, the CEO of Raphael, that this partnership came true. As a young engineer, I was young there, <coughs> I was impressed by your leadership, so it is a great honor for me to host you in Israel for this conference. For me, it's really the closing of a very important life cycle. Norma, Lucy Levine was one of the inventors of the Popeye system, which was the first system that was promoted uh, and produced and uh, delivered by LMC and, uh, and Rafael. Norma is a US aerospace businessman who served under undersecretary of the Army from 1979 to 1977. Norman joined Martin Marietta Corporation in, 19, in 1977. He was elected as CEO in 1977. 87 as a chairman in 1988. He served as a president of Lockheed Martin Corporation for the formation of the company in 1995 and became CEO later uh, <coughs> this year till 1997. Augustine currently serves as a chairman of the review of US Human Space Flights Plans Committee. <coughs> I would like to invite you, Norman, as our friend of system engineers in Israel, to give you a presentation. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, and thank all of you for the invitation to be a part of uh, this very significant day. I was born the uh, same year as Yossi Levine, and uh, our paths happened to cross uh, happily uh, when uh, uh, the firm I was with had the opportunity to work with uh, Raphael on the Popeye program and others. And uh, that was made possible really because of my good friend, uh, General Pellet, who, uh, whom I miss very much. I, I, uh, I'm also pleased to be back in Israel. I've been here many times and over the years have made many friends here that I treasure, and I always welcome the opportunity to be able to see them. Uh, I, the, it was mentioned that uh, this is your winter program, and uh, you were apologizing for the cold weather. I should tell you that about uh, two weeks ago, I returned from the South Pole, and this is lovely summer weather that you're having. Uh, it was also summer at the South Pole, I might say. Uh, we had only one blizzard, and the temperature was 30 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. I, I must confess at the outset that my degree is not in systems engineering. It's in aerodynamics. I'm an aerodynamicist, uh, uh, basically. But I've spent most of my career trying to be a systems engineer. And uh, while I have no parchment diplomas to show for it, I uh, do have a great deal of scar tissue that I've earned along the way. I, I've been asked to speak uh, about engineering leadership and systems engineering. And certainly, uh, one could ask uh, what the two topics have in common. Uh, they do sound a bit different. Uh, but the fact is that systems engineering is one of the major tools of leadership, uh, particularly when dealing with technical issues. Uh, I uh, would plan this morning to talk a little bit about leadership in general and then talk about systems engineering later and the conjunction of the two. Uh, I would note at the outset, though, that uh, systems engineering being a, a young and burgeoning field is one where there is widespread spread disagreement about exactly uh, what is systems engineering, what is the footprint, if you will, of systems engineering. Uh, uh, my friend Dan Roos at MIT, who began the systems engineering program there, or the engineering systems program, as they chose to call it, I uh, did a survey of college catalogs 
and discovered that, uh, I, I don't remember the exact number, but there were 20 or 30 quite different definitions of systems engineering that were being taught at various universities in the United States, all under the title of systems engineering. So as time goes on, perhaps we will better define uh, exactly what the meaning is. Uh, to be very brief uh, at the outset here, uh, if I were asked to give advice on leadership, uh, it would be very simple. Uh, it would be, first of all, to note that leaders need to be very good judges of people, of quality people, talented people, and motivated people. Uh, secondly, that uh, they be able to convince uh, people that what they're doing is worthwhile and important. And thirdly, uh, that they are willing to delegate. Uh, leadership uh, uh, is not necessarily doing things yourself, but getting others to do them. And uh, a leader can't do it alone. Uh, this requires uh, a great deal of confidence and trust uh, being placed in others. And so my, uh, my personal uh, advice to a leader, so my own advice is to find quality people, convince them what is needed and get out of the way. And the convincing of them of what is needed is very important because simply giving orders, uh, particularly to engineers, does not work very well. Uh, I would like to uh, start with a leadership quiz. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, I would like to ask uh, you, first, would you invest your money in this group of people? And second, who is the leader in that group of people? Uh, the answer to the first question in the exam is that that was the original Microsoft Corporation as it was formed in 1978. And so the answer is I hope you would have invested. And secondly, the leader is the young man at the bottom left, uh, Bill Gates. And the point I would like to make is it is not easy to recognize leaders by looking at them. Uh, leaders come wrapped in very different packages. Uh, uh, but underneath those packages, there are certain common qualities, and we will talk about some of those. Uh, I've found that the best way to recognize a leader is during times of challenge, uh, when things are going wrong, when troubled times. Uh, leaders tend to emerge and uh, be identified at times like that. And uh, there's a Swedish proverb I've always liked that says that every ship has a great captain in calm waters. And uh, it's the captain that steps forth in rough waters that uh, is identified as the leader. Uh, leadership does matter, and it can make a very great difference, uh, as is indicated uh, by the chart here. Uh, I don't think I have a laser pointer, but if you look at the, uh, the red line, well, I do have one. <laughs> yeah. If you look at the red line uh, here to the right, that's a plot of the stock price of the Procter & Gamble company. I had the privilege of working on the board, or serving on the board of Procter & Gamble for about 18 years. It's a company that's well over 100 years old, has always been very successful, and its stock price had always followed an upward trend like this. At this point right here, uh, the board of directors uh, took a step uh, that proved to be not a very good one, and we changed CEOs at that point. And amazingly, within one year, uh, our stock price had fallen in half. Uh, the board had done just one thing. At the bottom there, the board did, took another decision and put in a new CEO. And the, they immediately began to go up, and today the stock's up uh, about here. Uh, the newest CEO is the gentleman in the picture here, that, uh, his name is A.G. Laffley. Uh, he uh, uh, would be the first to say that he didn't do that alone, and certainly he didn't. But what he did was create an environment where everybody else could do it together, where everybody else could be at their best. He is a person that if you met him, he's very quiet. He doesn't yell at people or pound his shoe or shout. Uh, he's a person who inspires others to want to follow him and to succeed along with him. So leadership does make a great difference, and that's in an organization with 130,000 employees. 
Unfortunately, uh, poor leadership can also make a very great difference. Uh, this is a uh, chart taken from Fortune magazine in February of 2001. And it's a ranking of energy companies in the United States. And you'll notice that the most, most admired energy company in the U.S. was the Enron Company, by a large margin, uh, looking at the numbers. Just 10 months later, the, the cover of that same magazine had the following picture and the words, the Enron disaster, lies, arrogance, and betrayal. Uh, that's how quickly uh, poor leadership was able to bring down a very large company. So uh, leadership can work in both directions. But as we go on, maybe I should say a word about what is leadership. Uh, there's also disagreement uh, on that topic. Uh, General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower in the U.S., uh, has said that uh, uh, leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something that you want done because they want to do it. I think that's a very good definition. It points out, uh, once again, the willing following. Uh, leadership uh, is quite different from uh, or a leader, or the role of a leader is quite different from the role of a manager. A manager gets things done. A leader gets the right things done. Uh, both are important, obviously. The uh, best definition I've ever seen of leadership, however, comes from a, a tombstone in the British officer's uh, cemetery uh, at, uh, at Normandy. And it bears the inscription, leadership is wisdom and courage and carelessness of self. And the latter, I think, is of the utmost importance. Uh, a leader must always be thinking of their mission, what they're trying to accomplish, and never of themselves. Uh, interestingly, uh, I've found that over my career watching others uh, that the best way to get ahead is to try is not to try to get ahead, but rather just to do your current job to the best of your ability. Uh, leaders are always thinking of their troops, of the people that they're responsible for. Uh, I was always amused by this example. Here is a leader and her troops, and if you'll forgive me, you could say she has her ducks lined up in order. Uh, all seems well, but it turns out that this is not uh, a good leader. This is an example of a poor leader who does not think of her troops. And uh, you can see the problem uh, where she is one of those leaders who says, what happened? <laughs> I've found that there are three kinds of people. Uh, those who uh, uh, make things happen, those who uh, 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 Let's see here. I've got to get that back. The, the three who uh, uh, make things happen, uh, the people who help things happen, and people who ask what happened. And this was an example of the latter. There's a, uh, in the British Army, like most armies, uh, each year uh, officers are evaluated for their performance. And the one British officer's infamous evaluation report had written on it uh, by his superior officer, the following it said, this officer's troops would follow him almost anywhere, mostly out of curiosity. <laughs> that is not a good leader. Another attribute of leadership that's uh, been widely missed by CEOs in the United States uh, was brought out by one of the least uh, respected generals in U.S. history, General Custer, who uh, led one of the most disastrous battles uh, our country has, uh, has been engaged in. Uh, but he did say that the reward of command is the opportunity to lead, not to have a bigger tent. And that, I think, is something that, uh, as I said, has been forgotten. Uh, some of you may have seen my book of Augustine's Laws. Uh, if, if you have a copy, I'd congratulate you on being a member of a very select small group. Uh, one of my laws says that uh, if you combine hubris with greed and add financial leverage, 
it could be assured that disaster is not left to chance. A person uh, who many would say uh, was the dominant leader in assuring the survival of the United Kingdom in World War II was thrown out of office by his own people shortly after uh, that great accomplishment. Uh, leadership is certainly not a popularity contest. Uh, uh, it's a, a lonely task uh, where uh, one may be called upon to do things that are not at all welcome by most people. Uh, a teacher in the United States, a, a middle school teacher, had won an award and made a, some comments on leadership that I thought were extremely uh, insightful. Uh, her comment was as follows. Leaders are called to stand in that lonely place between the no longer and the not yet and intentionally make decisions that will bind, forge, move, and create history. We're not called upon to be popular. We're not called upon to be safe. We're not called upon to follow. We're the ones who called, are called upon to take risks. We're the ones called to change attitudes, to risk displeasures. We're the ones called to gamble our lives for a better world, which I think was a, a wonderful description. Let me turn to the most qual important quality of a leader in general. <coughs> and that would be uh, best illustrated by a story. And it's a story of a gentleman by the name of Herb Cranert, an American. Uh, some years ago, he was working uh, as a young man uh, for a a container corporation, a large container corporation. He was moving very fast through the ranks, was highly regarded, and, but was relatively young for his position. And one day the CEO of the corporation, or excuse me, the chairman of the board of the corporation, uh, came to Cranert and said that he would like, he was very impressed with what Cranert was doing and would like to put Cranert on the board of directors. Well, Cranert was stunned, he was very honored, said he was very honored, but the chairman then said that there is one condition. That condition is that you always vote exactly as I tell you. <laughs> uh, Craner, to his great credit, uh, responded with two words. He said, I quit. And he quit the company. Uh, the word got around what had happened. The next day he was at his home and six of his friends from the company were on the front porch and rang the doorbell. They said they had learned about what he had done and about what the company had done and that they too had quit, that they didn't want to work for that kind of a company and uh, that they wanted to work for him. Well, he said, that's a bit of a problem. I don't have a job. <laughs> uh, they said that uh, they thought maybe if they all sat down together, they could come up with an idea to create a company and he could run it and they could all work for him. So they sat in his living room uh, during the course of that morning, uh, they came up uh, with the idea of building uh, the Inland Container Corporation, what was one of the larger container corporations uh, in, in the world. Uh, and of course, what I refer to is that leaders have an ethical compass. Uh, people won't follow someone they can't trust. Another quality of leaders is that they see the big picture. Uh, there's a great danger in thinking too narrowly. I'll give an example of that. I, I grew up in the state of Colorado in the U.S., which is a very mountainous state. Uh, a few years ago, there was a series of very serious forest fires in the state. Uh, the governor uh, wanted to get uh, federal financial aid to fight the fires and to recover from them. And he went on television, and his audience was Washington, D.C. He wanted them to know how really bad things were. And what he did was to say, uh, his opening line was, Colorado is on fire. It's going up in flames. Well, he did get the money uh, from the uh, people who he was trying to convince. The problem was that there was another audience that he had overlooked, and that were all the tourists who had planned to come to the state and cancel their reservations. It didn't come, and it was very damaging to the state's economy for over a year. Uh, and at this point, uh, one transitions very easily into the notion of systems engineering which is to take the big picture, uh, to look at all the pieces at the same time and put them together. Uh, I'm going to talk quite a bit in my examples of systems engineering about failures. Uh, systems engineering, of course, has had many, many successes, 
but I think we often learn more from the failures. And so I will talk a bit about that. Uh, again, starting with definitions, I'm going to use my own definition of systems engineering since no one else seems to be able to agree. My definition is that systems engineering is the practice of creating the means of performing useful functions through the combination of two or more interacting elements. Uh, so let's start with fundamentals. Uh, the most basic system would be uh, two elements that interact with each other. And to make this really simple, let's make the interactions either be on or off. Uh, no uh, no uh, graduated scale, no, no analog uh, information here. It's binary. Each of the interactions is on or off. So uh, what one has, as you can see, uh, uh, is a, a very simple system. And you might say, what, what could go wrong in so simple a system? Well, it turns out even in a very simple system with only two components, things can go wrong. And it's not just in low-tech systems. High-tech systems with two components can also have problems. The uh, uh, simple system, uh, of course, has four possible states uh, of ons and offs. It's uh, a little like the example of flipping a coin twice. Uh, and you, the uh, example of a three element system and things going wrong uh, would be shown here. You have to think about that one for a moment. That's a three element system. Now, a, a two element system can have four possible states. A three element system can have 64 possible states. So it's complicated very quickly when dealing with uh, with systems. Uh, and that's a big piece of the problem. There's a gentleman, a professor by the name of Friedrich Reichhurst at the Max Planck Institute uh, who derived the general uh, equation for uh, uh, such interactions. And his equation is shown here. It is the number of potential states is equal to uh, where is the equation shown here where n is the uh, a uh, number of individual elements uh, that can interact uh, either on or off. He called the equation the monster, and for good reason. For example, a six-element system, uh, I'm sure you can quickly do in your head, a six-element system has 1,073,741,824 possible states. And uh, that's a very simple system uh, by most standards. I always loved this cartoon. The caption is a, a billion is a thousand million. Why wasn't I informed of this? Uh, most systems that we deal with have thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of, of individual components. Now, uh, one might say that uh, all those uh, components don't react with every other possible component, but uh, there are cases where perhaps uh, they do. Uh, electromagnetic interference comes to mind, a fire. Uh, in a system uh, comes to mind. And uh, uh, there are other conditions that uh, come from outside that can interact uh, with all the components. Uh, this is an example of a, oh, excuse me, I read the, uh, the caption before I showed you the cartoon. Uh, this is a complex system uh, of many components. It has many little brackets in it. It's a trainable radar. Uh, it's larger than a, a football field. Uh, but it has, uh, as do most complex systems, uh, the possibility of unintended consequences. Uh, I believe the electrical engineers refer to them as sneak circuits. Uh, it happened that in this case of this uh, particular system, uh, there was one bracket that was under designed. And uh, what took place uh, was a chain reaction where that one bracket, uh, which was a single point failure mode, uh, brought down the entire system. Uh, an example of an error in a complex system. And one of the most important things, of course, is to uh, design systems so they don't have single point failures. But that's very hard to do. Uh, in systems of this complexity. 
Uh, secondly, to be sure that when you do have failures, that the system fails gracefully. And thirdly, and very importantly, that the system, when it fails, fails safely. Uh, for example, at the traffic lights, uh, if you're designing the traffic light system, if there's, a, uh, if there's a system failure, you would like all the lights to turn red, not to turn green, uh, such as the notion of failing safe. And I've always been enjoy, enjoyed this examination question uh, by my roommate in college who went on to run a uh, Fortune 100 company in the U.S. Uh, that it's very hard to find uh, some of these uh, single point failure modes. He was good at finding things. This was an exam question that he had filled out. <laughs> Let me take a... Uh, more serious example, you may recall that uh, a few years ago, uh, a U.S. aerospace company, which shall be unnamed here, uh, was going to build a commercial aircraft that they referred to as the near-sonic transport. And the reason they got interested in the, uh, the near-sonic transport was that their marketing department had uh, conducted a, a survey of, uh, of, of potential uh, uh, passengers on the airlines, uh, and w one of the things the passengers wanted most was to get to where they were going fastest, fast, quicker. They didn't want to spend a lot of time getting there. And so uh, they gave the task uh, to the aerodynamicist to design an aircraft uh, that would meet that requirement of getting the passengers from where they started to where they wanted to be faster. And uh, as an aerodynamicist, I and they, uh, uh, they did, I would have probably, uh, decided that if you want to go faster, you've got to fly faster. And if you want to fly faster and you're subsonic, uh, and you can't go supersonic uh, over land was the, uh, was the assumption. Uh, what you have to do is creep up on the drag turf toward Mach 1 a little bit. Well, since most... Uh, Commercial aircraft fly not very much below Mach 1 to begin with. And as I'm sure everyone here knows, the drag rises very rapidly as you approach Mach 1. Uh, the penalties for flying a little bit faster are very, very great. And so what they either had to do was have much larger engines, greater fuel uh, usage, or else they had to find a way to flatten the drag curve a little bit. Uh, at best, it would be a very little bit. Uh, but they set out, uh, in fact, to move up the drag curve a little bit and try to flatten it a little bit. And they thought they could gain maybe half a Mach number or so. Uh, uh, point, perhaps go from Mach 0.8 to 0.85 as an example. And that was to be the transonic aircraft that uh, was to be the next generation. Now, if you give that same task to a systems engineer and you say to them, uh, whoop, what's happened here? How do I back up? I need help again. Hey, great. You got it. Well done. There's a systems engineer right there. All right. If you give that question to a systems engineer, uh, take the case of flying uh, from my home in Washington, D.C., or traveling from my home in Washington, D.C., uh, to a hotel in Atlanta for a trip. Uh, shown in the chart is the time it takes to get from my home to the airport. Uh, it shows the time it takes to go through the security at the airport, uh, board your aircraft, it then shows the time to fly from Washington to Atlanta, that third element of the top bar, and uh, right, right here. And it shows the time to uh, recover one's bags and obtain ground transportation at the airport in Atlanta, and then the time to get from the Atlanta airport into the uh, hotel where you want to go. Well, what the aerodynamicists were doing was decreasing this part here by uh, about seven or eight uh, percent. It works out to be about uh, uh, seven minutes. 
Uh, the Deer Sonic aircraft would uh, fly you from your home to where you want to be in five hours and 43 minutes. The elapsed time uh, with the current generation was five hours and 50 minutes. Uh, a different view when you look at it from a system standpoint. And when you ask how much more people would pay for a ticket uh, to get to their place in Atlanta seven minutes faster, uh, it turns out there are not many people that are willing to pay for that extra fuel. Uh, that leads to the point that uh, leaders and systems engineers need to think uh, strategically. Strategic vision is so important. Uh, an example uh, comes from uh, Alexander Graham Bell, who is credited with uh, uh, inventing the telephone. He offered the patent rights to Western Union, a very large corporation at the time, uh, that provided uh, telegraph services principally. He offered them the rights to the telephone for $100,000. Uh, they turned it down. And much later, a, a memo was found in the archives of the Western Union uh, asking uh, why would anyone want to have a telephone when you could communicate perfectly well with the telegraph and Morse code. Uh, certainly an example of a failure of strategic thinking. Let me take an example, if you'll permit me, from my own life. Uh, the second time I uh, left the government uh, where I was serving and I was going back to industry, uh, there were two jobs that I was primarily considering. Uh, let's see. One was with uh, the Martin Aerospace Company. One was with the Fairchild Aerospace Company. Uh, the two companies were very similar. They both built airplanes. In fact, their headquarters were just a few miles apart. And in fact, Fairchild was uh, the CEO, was a former employee of Martin. So they were very much alike. Uh, I decided to uh, join the, uh, the uh, Martin Company. Uh, and it turned out that they had had, their management had, had a very tough decision to make. Uh, this was before I got there. Uh, there was much less demand for airplanes at that particular point in time, but both were airplane companies. Uh, the Martin management decided that the future was going to have to include space and electronics. The Fairchild Company said, we're good at building airplanes, we'll build airplanes. And uh, that proved to be a, a rather fatal decision for them. And uh, if you follow what happened subsequently in terms of sales, annual sales, uh, the Martin Company grew, joined with Lockheed, and continued to grow to where it's about $45 billion a year. Uh, Fairchild, when last seen, was sold to a French firm for $60 million. Uh, I had very little to do with that. Uh, it was a very wise decision that was made and uh, could have a, an enormous impact, and it was made by thinking strategically and I might add, courageously. I've always enjoyed uh, the following quotation. More than any other time in history, we face a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other to total extinction. Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. Uh, that was Woody Allen. And I might say that that was a chart I used to show a lot uh, when the Berlin Wall, excuse me, not the Berlin Wall, when the... Uh, uh, the wall fell between the Soviet Union and the uh, free world, and the U.S. defense uh, budget was collapsing, uh, we were faced with just such a question. And it's very important to have a strategy at times like that. Our strategy at Martin Marietta was very simple. Uh, it was to join with other companies uh, that had half-full factories, just as we did, to combine with those companies to uh, uh, close half the factories and operate half as many factories at full capacity so that we could be very competitive and therefore acquire market share. And so our goal was to acquire market share during those years. And in fact, we did combine uh, 17 companies during all or parts of 17 companies during four or five years. Uh, and the, all parts of the companies or all of them are shown in this chart. I might mention the greatest advantage we achieved was never shown on the financial statement. Uh, the greatest advantage we achieved was to have people with those 17 different backgrounds sitting around the same table addressing problems and how one might best solve them. 
My favorite example of strategic thinking and of very courageous thinking comes from my friend Kent Cressa, who uh, ran the Northrop Grumman Corporation at the time I was running Lockheed Martin. We were at a meeting together. We happened to be sitting next to each other by coincidence. And before the meeting started, I was reading the USA Today, the newspaper. And it had the following uh, quotation about uh, uh, Northrop Grumman. I refer to the part in Brown that says CEO Kent Cressa also said Northrop will continue to sell non-productive assets. Last year it sold its headquarters in Los Angeles for $218 million. <laughs> That's strategic thinking at its best. It's also been observed that uh, leaders exercise sound, sound judgment. Uh, a classic example in my mind of the failure to exercise sound judgment would have to be, uh, and it, timely today, uh, the case of the, uh, the Titanic. Uh, the Titanic, as you may know, was designed to take uh, 2,224 passengers and crew aboard. Uh, it was considered by the designers to be unsinkable. And therefore, they included lifeboat stations for 1,178 persons. Now, the logic here from a systems engineering viewpoint is a bit troublesome. Uh, if the ship is unsinkable, uh, you probably don't need lifeboats. If it is sinkable, you probably need lifeboats for at least as many as for everybody on board. Uh, but they provided lifeboat stations for half as many people who were on board, apparently thinking the ship would half sink or something like that. Uh, we all know the outcome uh, that uh, uh, actually 1,515 people uh, died in that accident because of the terrible judgment that was made and the failure to look at uh, uh, a system in a more logical viewpoint. But it is true that uh, systems engineers have to take uh, risks as do leaders. Uh, it's been said that you can't explore the distant horizons while safely anchored in a harbor. Uh, certainly true. But uh, I'm not arguing for taking irrational risks. I'm arguing for taking uh, considered risks uh, based on careful judgment, uh, the kinds of risks that are necessary in business or systems engineering. Uh, one of my favorite stories uh, was a story that, about something that took place when I was serving in our government. And uh, a group of us were taking a, a small course uh, where the instructor was talking about risk and risk management. And the instructor had said that uh, uh, he wanted to cite an example. And he got a volunteer he called on from the audience. And the gentleman in the audience stood up. And the person giving the course said, imagine that I had a huge I-beam that stretched across the floor here in front of the podium. And he said to the gentleman in the audience, he said, I will give you $20 if you will walk across that I-beam. Would you do it? And the guy said, of course, sure. The instructor then said, uh, supposing I take that identical I-beam and place it between two 40-story buildings over a highway, and now I will give you the same $20 bill if you'll walk across the same I-beam, would you do it? And the guy in the audience said, no, I wouldn't. And the instructor had made his point about being sure that the benefits are worth the risks, uh, but he continued on, unfortunately for him. And uh, he said, now supposing that I-beam is still above the 40-story buildings, and I'm standing on one of the buildings, and you're on the other building, he said, I'm holding one of your kids out over the edge. And I say to you, if you don't walk across the I-beam, I'm going to drop your kid. He said, now would you walk across the I-beam? And the guy in the audience said, which kid do you have? <laughs> <laughs> That's an absolutely uh, true story. So I draw the difference between taking uh, considered risks and uh, 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 arbitrary risks. And the greatest example of risk taking that ever in business that came to, uh, into my, my own life I had to do with an occurrence some years ago. I was working at Martin Marietta Corporation. Uh, my boss was uh, uh, Tom Pownall, who was the CEO. He was my predecessor as CEO at Martin Marietta. Uh, 
and we had a hostile takeover attempt against our company by the uh, Bendix Corporation. Uh, and basically, what they were going to do was buy our company out from under us. And uh, this was one of the not very attractive things that could happen in business. Uh, we first learned about it uh, when it showed up on the ticker that uh, they had tickers in those days, uh, paper, uh, saying that the Bendix Corporation was going to buy our company and take, take it over, hostile. Uh, before we could do anything, Bendix bought 72% of our stock. So the Bendix Corporation owned us. They literally owned our company. Uh, our CEO, Tom Pinal, decided that uh, if Bendix was going to own us, then we would own Bendix, that we weren't going to give up. Uh, that before Bendix could take our company over, uh, we would buy a majority of Bendix shares. Uh, that's exactly what we did. And so now we own Bendix, and Bendix owned us. If they wanted to meet in our boardroom, we wanted to meet in their boardroom. And uh, the thing that really complicated matters was that the two companies uh, were competitors, and we were competing for business. And when we competed, uh, we wanted them to win because we got the money if they won. <laughs> but the problem was they wanted us to win because they got the money if we won. It's a whole new concept in competition that uh, Eventually, we sued each other in, uh, I think it was 34 different states and four federal district courts, and finally arrived at a business uh, solution in which the Bendix Corporation went out of business. We took on enormous debt, 82% uh, debt to total capital, but we survived and the company continued to prosper uh, over time. Uh, that's an example of not just taking courage in, my, uh, courage in my mind, that's an example of audacity. Here's what's meant by audacity. Now one of the problems, of course, that managers face uh, and systems engineers is that you often have to make a decision before you have all the information that you need to have or that you would like to have. You may have to operate on incomplete information. In fact, you usually do. Uh, but is generally the case that the worst thing you could do is to make no decision. So uh, a manager, a leader has a dilemma in this regard. Uh, let me give an example uh, from my own career. I was running our astronautics business and the Skylab was orbiting the Earth, a very heavy object, and it was gr its orbit was gradually decaying till it was going to re-enter the Earth, uh, hit, impact the Earth's surface. And it wasn't clear where it would impact. Uh, the fear was it might land on a city, although the chances were very small that that would happen. Well, the government decided to make a major investment in trying to uh, build a uh, teleoperator retrieval system, a picture of which is shown here. We won the contract to uh, build it. That would go up a dock with the Skylab and drive it into the ocean, into the Pacific, South Pacific Ocean, where it would do no harm. Unfortunately, the government took so long to make up its mind to do this, uh, indecision, if you will, that there was very little time to accomplish the engineering part of the task. The, uh, uh, the company was going to have to invest some of its own money in this, which uh, uh, was troublesome to us because it wasn't clear we had enough time to complete the job before the Skylab would re-enter. And this is a story that is, I think, important because it points to the fact that one has to be very sure in doing a systems engineering analysis that you've included all the elements to the system in your analysis. And the, that's challenging because if you include every possible thing that could impact your system, you probably wind up with something you can't analyze. On the other hand, if you leave something out that's important, uh, that's a big problem. Well, in this case, there was something that was part of our system uh, that we knew about but uh, was unpredictable. We didn't control it. Uh, namely, uh, solar flares. And the solar flares that would occur during the years we were developing our, uh, our telerobotic system would change the density of the upper atmosphere, if uh, it could change it in a fashion that would cause the Skylab to re-enter uh, earlier than predicted. And so we were in a race, basically, with solar activity, not knowing uh, exactly what the solar activity would be. Well, as it turns out, we lost the race, and Skylab uh, 
impacted in the outback in Australia, uh, fortunately not doing any great damage. In fact, for the Aborigines, it was fortunate because they were soon selling pieces of Skylab to the tourists. But it does point uh, to the fact that there may be things that are part of your system that it's awfully easy to overlook. Another very fundamental question is, what is it you're trying to accomplish uh, with your system? Uh, in the example here, uh, here's some uncontrollable variable. Here's the, uh, the outcome or the payoff, if you will, a good outcome and a bad outcome. And as a function of what the variable may be, what the outcome would be for three different options. And if your goal in life is to have a chance for the very best possible outcome, then uh, obviously you want to uh, uh, choose uh, system A. If you're willing to trade a little bit on the best possible outcome to, sure, to have a greater probability of a reasonably good outcome, uh, uh, you, you uh, might uh, uh, decide to choose uh, option C. If your goal, excuse me, I have that wrong. Yeah, no, we're okay. Uh, but if you want to uh, assure that you get the least negative outcome, then you, you want a still different option. And very often people get into these systems engineering analyses without properly selecting which outcome it is that they would like. Now, it turns out that uh, when taking a risk, there's a lot you can do uh, to assure that, uh, to hedge your bet, if you will. Financially, uh, you can hedge uh, uh, currencies. Uh, this is an example of an early airplane that uh, had a roll stability problem, and they, they managed the risk. They were aware of the risk, and they managed it so that they could land either right side up or upside down. I think the principal lessons I've learned about risk taking and systems engineering are first of all, to be sure know what it is you're trying to accomplish. Second, to be sure that you understand the risks you're taking, being aware of them. Third, to be sure the benefits are worth the, uh, uh, the possible bad outcomes. Uh, fourth, to have a risk management uh, program in place. And then lastly, to be sure that you can survive the worst case. And that's something that uh, some very intelligent people have, failed, have overlooked and have failed to pay attention to. Harold Shapiro, the former president at, uh, at Princeton University, made the following comment. He said, I do not recommend failure, nor am I attracted to the idea that failure builds character. But the willingness to accept the risk of failure is one of the costs of leadership, and therefore the price of all success, which I think makes a great deal of sense. Another attribute of leaders in dealing with uh, problems, engineering or otherwise, is that they listen. They listen to others and they listen to the hardware. Uh, I've always enjoyed this from, uh, it applies to writing software. Uh, the users exclaimed with a laugh and a taunt, it's, not what, it's just what we ask for, but not what we want. So when leaders listen, they have to also ask the right questions and uh, be sure uh, that they're getting uh, the correct views. And as an example of this, I'm going to resort to the uh, space shuttle program and one of its most tragic days, uh, the loss of the Challenger. Uh, it provides a very unfortunate example of what happens when decisions are made on incomplete data, and in this case, uh, incomplete data when there was more complete data available. Uh, as you'll all recall, it began with uh, uh, very great promise and uh, about 72 seconds in flight, uh, the uh, shuttle uh, exploded. Uh, this was a case where the management did not listen to advice and when they uh, uh, did begin to listen, uh, had inadequate advice, uh, didn't pursue the matter far enough. These are excerpts uh, from uh, memos that were provided to the management of the company that built the solid rocket motor that failed in the years and months before the launch. That's probably too small for you to read, but uh, one of them, uh, this, these are technical uh, papers, if you will. Uh, one of the engineers had written to the management is my honest and real fear that if we not take immediate action, we stand in jeopardy of losing a flight along with the launch pad facilities. 
Another memo began with the word HELP in capital letters, pointing to the dangers of the seals on the solid rocket motor segments uh, failing due to temperature uh, variations. The uh, early warnings were not uh, uh, considered by the engineers, systems engineers by and large. And uh, the night before the launch, the, when the decision was made whether to launch or not, the following chart was presented. It's a chart of the temperature uh, uh, outside, the ambient temperature outside uh, the launch vehicle that would affect the seals between the segments of the solid prop, uh, propellant motors. Uh, that's on the uh, abscissa. Uh, on the vertical axis, it shows the uh, number of incidents, uh, near failures, if you will, that had occurred in prior flights. And the question was, because it was a very cold day in Florida, very cold day in Florida, uh, were the SEALs uh, failures sensitive to temperature, or did the, were they unrelated to temperature? And this was, these were the data that were presented. Uh, there had been seven prior flights uh, that are shown here during which the O-rings, the SEALs, had had uh, signs of damage. And uh, when the people looking at the chart looked at this chart you're looking at, they concluded that there really was no evidence that there was any connection between the failure uh, and the uh, ambient temperature at the time of launch. And uh, the, there was one point here, a couple points here, one here, two here, one here. Uh, the conclusion was no strong uh, correlation. That was all the data they were given. After the failure, uh, the data were plotted in another fashion by a systems engineer who rather than just plotting the failures, plotted all the flights, including the ones that had had, excuse me, the, the problems with the SEALs. Uh, he, he plotted all the flights, including those where there were no problems with the SEALs or near failures of the SEALs. And that's what that chart looked like. And here you'll see that uh, above 75 degrees Fahrenheit, there were six flights, none with damage. Below 65 degrees Fahrenheit, there were four flights, all with damage. A very different conclusion, uh, as you can see. The, these are all data points here, clearly a strong trend suggesting a sensitivity to cold temperatures. And worse yet, the temperature outside on the day the Challenger was launched was somewhere up here, or excuse me, out here. It was way off the, any, prior, uh, any prior experience. Uh, and sadly, uh, it illustrated uh, the importance of uh, a thorough systems analysis, uh, looking at all the data uh, that's available or could be made available. Another example that I would cite, and as I've said, I'm talking about problems here, not about successes, uh, pertains to the uh, Hubble Space Telescope uh, uh, that Lockheed Martin had built. Uh, one of the astronauts once told me, the chief astronaut in fact, uh, told me that uh, listen to the hardware, it will talk to you. And indeed the hardware will talk to you very often. And after the failure, it talks to you a lot. Uh, the key is to talk to, to it before the failure. In the case of the Hubble, you remember there was great promise of getting uh, really terrific uh, photographs uh, of space, uh, such as the photograph shown on the right here. That was what was expected. But you may also recall that when the Hubble first went into orbit and began to be used, the pictures that came back were the ones on the left, not on the right. Very, very disappointing. I had no clear understanding of why. Well, one of the better detective jobs I've ever seen that was run by Lou Allen, former chief of staff of our Air Force. Uh, they began, uh, they built a, a good simulation of the Hubble Space Telescope and they began taking pictures of space, uh, and, of space objects, and then they would introduce errors in their model to try to replicate the pictures they were actually getting. And one of the things that they discovered was if there were an error of 1.2 millimeters in the primary mirror, that you could replicate almost exactly the data that was coming back from space. 
Now, 1.2 millimeters, you know, when you're dealing with mirrors, is that's like miles. It's unthinkable. You deal in angstroms. Uh, but that's what it showed. And uh, anyway, they continued to pursue the topic. And they went back finally and discovered that the jig that had been used to make the primary mirror uh, was still in a storeroom at the company that had built it, Perkin Elmer. And uh, the jig, uh, you could see, uh, it was a smoking gun. Uh, there was a very high probability that it, it would introduce a 1.2 millimeter error. And as you all know, happily, uh, uh, the, uh, it was possible to launch a, uh, a space shuttle uh, to uh, put a corrective lens uh, in the optical chain uh, of the uh, telescope and that we, after that, began getting uh, wonderful pictures uh, such as the one shown here of, uh, of serpents. Leaders and systems engineers do know that the devil's in the details. Uh, they've learned it the hard way. Sometimes you don't understand all the details. There are known unknowns and unknown unknowns. As an example, I would like to share with you uh, the story of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge uh, in the northwestern United States. This is some years ago. It's a suspension bridge, and it failed uh, uh, in a very light wind. And I don't remember the exact wind. I think it was around 25 knots. And the designers never imagined that a 25-knot wind could cause the bridge to fail. The thing that the designers had overlooked was an aerodynamic problem, uh, namely that the vortices that were shed by the bridge had a natural frequency that was identical to the frequency of the bridge. And pretty, it was just like soldiers marching across a bridge in unison. There's a movie of this failing. And the bridge is just flying up and down in this very light wind because of the... Uh, uh, the failure to pay attention to details. Another example uh, from the, the company I served background, uh, we put the first soft landers on Mars. And uh, the day before the launch of the first lander, or the night before, uh, the engineers were all sitting around, the systems engineers were sitting around trying to figure out is there anything they could have overlooked uh, during the design, was there any possible thing they overlooked. And somebody uh, got thinking that the, in those days, this was some years ago, computer models were far more primitive. And our computer model of the kinematics of uh, uh, space objects uh, included Mars, it included the Sun, it included the Earth. It didn't include the Earth's moon. And somebody got thinking, wouldn't it be embarrassing if on the way from Cape uh, Kennedy to Mars, we inadvertently smashed into the moon? And so a quick check was conducted and I'm happy to report that the moon was nowhere near uh, where we would accidentally run into it. Still another example of a systems engineering problem that comes back to this issue of, of while you take the big picture, you still have to pay attention to the details. It comes from the very first launch of the space shuttle. Uh, there are, I, I think, over a million people in Florida to watch this first launch. Uh, and uh, those of us who were in the uh, uh, control uh, facility uh, were aware that one of the things that had to be done just before the launch was to synchronize all five of the computers that were on the shuttle, uh, time synchronize them. And the way that was uh, done was after the first computer had been synchronized, it uh, pulses were set out periodically uh, with very large spaces between the pulses. These were very narrow pulses. And the other four computers, uh, you would turn them on one at a time. And here's where you turned on one computer at some random time, and it would start searching for the pulse. And when it hit the change, a rapid change in voltage, it would initialize, this is the second computer really, it would initialize itself with the first computer, and you'd repeat that for the five computers. Well, it turned out that one of the computers wouldn't synchronize. And uh, an engineer there, interestingly, figured out quickly what the problem was, probably, and said, just unplug it and plug it in again, it'll be OK. Well, of course, nobody did that, thank goodness, uh, even though he was right. Turned out, due to bad luck, and this is on the very first flight, with all the crowds there, that when the, uh, uh, in the first flight, when the uh, computer 
uh, first computer was turned on and uh, they began the search to synchronize the second computer, instead of turning it on during this interval here and looking for the rapid change, it just happened to be turned on right in the middle of one of the pulses. And when it got to the end of the pulse, it saw a rapid change. It said, oh, we'll synchronize here instead of here. And that was the problem. And I always cite that Mother Nature is not belligerent, but Mother Nature is very unforgiving. Another of the major lessons, I'm nearing the end here, uh, that I've learned uh, over the years where we've had problems uh, way too often is the assumption that having uh, 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 redundancy uh, will make you safe. Uh, redundancy is obviously a, a, a very positive thing to have, but too often we forget that to have redundancy, the elements that produce redundancy have to be independent of each other, totally independent of one another. Uh, and an example of a failure to recognize that, just one of many I could cite, uh, where you had redundancy but not independence, and this one's rather subtle, uh, applies to the 1011 aircraft. Uh, it had three engines. The engines were totally independent. Uh, it was one of the reasons for having three engines, so that if you lost one, you could continue on. Uh, this particular flight was going from Miami to, uh, I think, uh, the Bahamas. And uh, shortly after takeoff, the pilot got a warning light of, a, uh, of a, uh, an oil leak in one of the engines. So he shut the engine down. Uh, a few minutes later, he got a, a warning of an oil leak in the second of the three engines. This had never happened to him before. It seemed almost inconceivable that on one flight, you could have two identical failures. So he shut the second engine down, turned around, and limped back into... Uh, uh, Miami, just as he got a warning light that the third engine uh, had an oil leak. Uh, well, you say, how could that possibly happen in three separate engines? Well, it turns out the way it happened was fairly straightforward. That uh, the engines, the aircraft had just come out of maintenance, and one of the things that had been done was to replace something called a chip detector. Uh, it's a little thing you screw into each of the uh, engines in the oil loop. Uh, uh, the plumbing of the oil system. Uh, and this chip detector, detector has a little oil ring on it to seal to be sure that it doesn't uh, leak oil. Uh, they had changed the chip detectors on all three engines. Uh, some months before, at a sub-subcontractor, there was a person whose job was to take the components of the chip detector and put them in a plastic bag, and then send them to another contractor to assemble the components into the chip detector, which was by the mechanics put into the engine. The, uh, the problem was that the person who put the parts in the plastic bag uh, forgot to put the oil rings, the, uh, the O-rings in the bags that morning. And so everything that went out of there that morning was missing the O-rings. And so the systems, you had three redundant engines, so-called, but they weren't independent. They had a common element. The element was the person who put the parts in the bags. And that brings me then to leadership's biggest problem, by far the biggest problem that uh, systems engineers face. Uh, that, of course, is humans. And you'll find this hard to believe, but humans do make mistakes. Uh, they do irrational things. Uh, People have won Nobel Prizes pointing out uh, irrational things people do in economics. And uh, that's always one of the great challenges. And I will cite uh, what to me is one of the more intriguing uh, problems I've encountered. Uh, it involved a system that had two separate vehicles with two huge cable bundles going between the two vehicles. Uh, a systems engineer very wisely noticed that uh, it would be possible for a mechanic to inadvertently switch the two cable bundles uh, between the two vehicles. So he very cleverly uh, made one cable bundle a 16-pin cable bundle and the other an 18-pin cable bundle. Well, it turns out the strongest mechanic in the, in the, uh, in the United States converted a 16-pin connector to an 18-pin connector, as shown there. 
Which brings us to, uh, I just love happy endings. But if you do it all right, and uh, an example of a systems undertaking that uh, points out what you can really accomplish. Uh, this is a picture of a two-story house. It's in San Diego. Uh, the San Diego trade unions all got together and said, if we really plan things carefully and we really organize, how quickly can we build a, a three-bedroom, two-story house starting with a vacant lot and uh, painting the house, putting in the carpeting, the furniture, the lawn, the garden, and everything. How quickly can we do that with a large number of people with a careful system plan? And th this was not a prefab house. This is a conventional house uh, with studs and plaster and so on. Uh, I won't ask you how long you think it took them to build that house because uh, you will embarrass yourselves. I have a video, which I unfortunately don't have time to show, but uh, they built that house and ready to move in. Furniture, lawns, landscaping, three hours and 42 minutes. Shows what you can do with good systems engineering and good planning. And uh, there's one other element that I should probably leave as a final word. Uh, that's the house. I should leave a final word comes from Al Uteki that uh, founded Flight Systems Incorporated. Actually, it's six words. And he said, if at all possible, be lucky. And that's the advice I'd like to offer. Thank you very much. Oh, you want two questions? <laughs> That's a terrific question. And, uh, and I, I, first of all, I meant to apologize for speaking in English. My Hebrew is not good. But uh, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that they worked over a period of months and how many actual hours went into it. But uh, they, they organized into teams where uh, the carpenters all wore blue shirts and the uh, plumbers wore red shirts and electricians wore yellow shirts. Uh, the county inspectors uh, joined in this. They, they had to pack all the inspections. They wore basketball referees uniforms that they would come in and they would blow a whistle when you could go ahead. I, I have a question. We heard uh, here in, uh, in Israel some uh, dispute if uh, system engineering is uh, uh, process oriented or people oriented. Do you have any idea on this? Actually, I do have an idea. My answer would be yes. Uh, <laughs> I think it's break time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah.